When you go out to the course, do you ever feel like you don't have the most confidence in your backhand or your throw in general and you find yourself questioning if you're doing things correctly and you're not seeing the results that you want? In this episode, we bring on Craig Nettleship, who has been a longtime Innova-sponsored player, and he teaches us a ton about how you can improve your backhand, how you're able to throw better shots more consistently and hit different kinds of angles, different kinds kinds of shots. We talk about hyzer flips and hyzers, hyzers. We talk about all different kinds of things, break them down, break them down how you can execute those throws. And we give you some drills that you can go out and do today that will help you throw better in disc golf. Because at the end of the day, to have success in disc golf, you have to throw the disc well. But not only do you have to throw the disc well, you have to put the disc into the basket. Greg shares some of his tips for how you can become a better putter as well and gives us a fantastic drill that I have been using personally and I've definitely seen some more confidence and more success in my own putt. Make sure you stay tuned through the end of the episode because we have a fantastic discussion during our hot take about the PDGA rating system if it should go, if it should stay, what's the pros, what's the cons. It's a fantastic discussion and if you're like Trenton and I after hearing Craig's ideas and his thoughts behind his hot take, you're going to have a completely different outlook on the rating system. And just a couple of house cleaning items before we get into today's episode. First off, I wanted to say thank you so much to all of those Patreon subscribers. Again, the first 10 who sign up are going to be getting a disc from myself as well as from Trenton. So thank you guys so much for doing that. And I just wanted to give a huge shout out to our newest Patreon member. Pat McVeigh, thank you so much for your support in the Birdie Club. Make sure you check out the clubs that we have available. If you're an Eagle Club member, you get to come on our podcast once a quarter for a roundtable episode. If you're an Ace Club member, you get that monthly. So definitely make sure you check those out. Thank you so much to Brian Pittman and Brady Beaker who are in the Eagle Club as well as Daffy Duck WOT in the Ace Club. We'll be doing an episode with these guys here in a little bit. You still got some time. Make sure you get in this week when you're listening to this episode because we're going to be recording that podcast very soon. As well as, I just wanted to say again, thank you for all the ratings and reviews you guys are leaving on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Those are super duper helpful, and it helps us know what do you like, what do you not like, what do you want to see more of. How can we better serve you guys and give you value to help you become a better a better disc golfer? Because at the end of the day, that is the goal. And I just wanted to clear something up a little bit. I know we've seen a lot of YouTube comments saying, you know, hey, where's Horatio at? Horatio has decided to take a step back with the brand just he's got a ton going on right now and and saw how fired up Trenton was and we just kind of decided that for now maybe it's just best for a little bit of a break to take place and if everything works out and in the future if it works for everyone then maybe he will come back a little bit let's get into this interview with Craig right now hi this is Craig Nettleship and you're listening to the Chain Clickers podcast Alrighty, guys, you heard him in the intro. Super excited to talk to Craig today. Craig, how's it going, man? I know before we started recording, we were talking. You're telling me it's uh, over 100 degrees in Minnesota, man. I, I'm, I don't believe it. I'm going to have to see a screenshot or something. Uh, today, it didn't quite make it, make it over 100. It made it uh, 94, 95. Sunday, they're predicting 103. You know, I left the Atlanta Heat to come up here. I don't need this. Yeah, that is, uh, that is something we were dealing with here in Wichita. It's about... It's about 98, 99 like every day, right? It feels like 106 with 80% humidity. It seems. And it's a, it's a good time. Where, where exactly are you at in uh, Min, uh, Minnesota? Uh, I am about 20 minutes West of Minneapolis in Chanhassen. So are there actually, I, I think I know the answer, but like, what is the population to like disc golf kind of ratio in Minnesota? Like how big would you say is it in Minnesota? And to that, I know Minneapolis is a big city. In our last episode, we talked to David Feltz who went over to Seattle for a little bit in his disc golf journey. And he said there were, there were only a couple of courses there in Seattle. Like, is it kind of the same in Minneapolis or is there an abundance of courses there? No, we have an abundance of courses. In fact, Minnesota has 
the third most disc golf courses of all states. We have over 300. And right from the city center of Minneapolis, if you draw a 50-mile radius, you've got over 100 courses to play, in- including courses like Blue Ribbon Pines, which is always top 10 in the nation. How did that happen? How did that become? Like, is it kind of like we were talking a little bit before show, you know, how Emporia is kind of a disc golf mecca. The whole town is behind it. Is that how it is in the entire state? Like, how did that happen? You know, I honestly don't know. I do know that somehow um, Steady Ed put one of the first 10 courses he installed here in uh, Minnesota. And you can still go play it. It's still in its its original tact. Um, What I think happened is the Minnesota Minnesota Frisbee Association is one of the oldest uh, Frisbee disc flying clubs. Um, And I think that had to be what was driving it. I, again, I don't really have a good explanation. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. I th- I like to think we're blessed here in Wichita, which we definitely are. Kansas, Wichita, all the above. We got plenty of courses. But if I could draw a circle, fifty miles around here and count a hundred courses, I think we definitely can't. But I bet you we're around, we're over forty, fifty. So you said, do you know? Do you happen to know the name of the one of the first courses Steady Ed put up there? And is and you said the, is the original layout still available to play? Because that would be fun. It's still there and. I know somebody's going to correct me. I think it's Moore Park, M O I R Park, and they have the original. Do you, do you know if you guys have ever seen them? The old metal cones, where you, where you had the you had the catch basket, but then you had the metal cone like this. The disc hits the metal cone and it's deflected down. I think I've seen. I think I just. <laughs> it's funny. I think I just saw a picture of one of those maybe a week ago for the first time so oh yeah (laughs) i didn't yeah i did not know realize that was a thing but it makes sense yeah okay yeah i gotcha cool so something that's kind of you know interesting to me i guess minnesota is such a great state for disc golf and you also see it's been on the disc golf pro tour a ton the next uh event on the disc golf pro tour is in Clearwater, Minnesota, the preserve championship. Have you played that course? And could you maybe just give a little bit of background on if you have, how difficult that course is to somebody who hasn't played that before? Yes, I have played that course. They play it on the black bear. Um, it is at the preserve. It's a kale, kale design. And the black bear is, I mean, if you don't have a cannon, you don't have much of it, much of a shot. I mean, it is just, it's long, and once it starts in on you, it just doesn't let up. If you ever, I don't, you guys probably have, but, you know, I'm lucky enough to have played golf with a lot of these guys up here, you know, like Ryan Sheldon, who's got a 600-foot forehand, you know, Dan Beto, who throws prodigious distance. And these guys are friends because they're local. When you go and see those guys and others, like, you know, Drew and Calvin and all those guys just ripping discs. They could play the back black bear and score, but for normal humans, just just go go for the experience and go for the beauty because it's set out on what used to be a golf course. So it's very picturesque, lots of lakes, lots of wildlife, absolutely beautiful. But don't expect to score. Yeah, I think that's. Um... I had to learn that the hard way. Not that I expected to score, but I played a little bit of Jones Supreme when I was uh-huh. in BDO this year. We talked about that a little bit. And uh, it's it's really humbling to watch these, any of the pro-level athletes, FPO, MPO, anyone play. And uh, they make it look so easy. And then you get out there like, I can do that. And you throw it 150, <laughs> 200 feet shy of where they were landing. So when they when they hit those when they get those birdies, I mean it can really it can really add you know when you see that it's like wow that's amazing so that's a really good point when you go out and play these championship level courses you know us uh, lower level or even some of the top level pros you just gotta you just gotta humble yourself and can't always expect to score every throw but um, have a good time while you're out there and take in the the beauty of these courses absolutely. Let's go all the way back to when your disc golf journey first began. I remember you had said you got out of the Atlanta heat. Did you start disc golf in Atlanta? Where did disc golf start for you? So there, there's a little bit of a there's a little bit of a fade in there. So um, I was living here in Minneapolis. I came up in 2009 uh, for work, and in Christmas 2011, my brother-in-law had been playing disc golf for a couple of years and invited me to go and throw with some of his friends. And I was like. 
no, I have no interest. And he nags me, come on. No, I really have no interest. And then I get this little ping in my head and go, you know, he's been in the family 20 years. I don't really know the guy. It's not that we did have, like, we're very likable, but I just never had anything really in common with him. And so I went and played disc golf with him. So went out there, shot, I don't know, probably 200, who knows. Um, and didn't really think much of it, but it was nice to kind of make that connection with my brother-in-law. So fast forward, I'm up here. It's April 2012. I'm walking through the local mall, and I see this store called Air Traffic. And there is a wall of hundreds of discs. And it's some random Saturday afternoon, whatever. I'm like, oh, I should pick up a disc and go mess around with that. I mean, spring is starting to come around. So I went and got a disc and said, oh, I remember that's an end of a Valkyrie. I remember throwing that one halfway decent, you know, with Mike, you know, my brother-in-law. Like, okay. So I get that and start throwing it. And then I started talking to Mike about what I was doing and how I could get better. And he started giving me ideas and this and that, and, you know, YouTube this and this and that. All of a sudden, we're talking three, four times a week, and because of a $9 piece of plastic, he went from brother-in-law to legitimate brother. We still talk three or four times a week. So that disc golf can bring people together in ways that you didn't even see coming. Like, that's literally almost verbatim exactly what happened with myself and Horatio. We are, so to give the big picture here, so... He is married to my fiance's sister. So they're sisters. And so now we're about to be in-laws as well. And so literally, like, we really didn't have a whole little lot in common. We really didn't talk a whole lot. And then during the pandemic, I was like, dog, you got to get into disc golf because <laughs> we came up and there was nothing to do. Everything was closed. Right. And I just so happened to have my Paul. And I did not know how valuable this disc was at the time. My Paul Macbeth four-time world champion Innova Destroyer. I was, let me lay the land for you guys. I was throwing this as my water disc. I was like, <laughs> this is the disc that I need to throw over the water in case I lose it. That's how little I knew about disc golf when I first got started, right? And so I had that and I had like... Two or three, I had three other discs. I can't remember what they were. And so, you know, I gave one to my fiance, her sister, and Horatio. And literally from that point on, we were instantly hooked. And it literally went from we barely ever talked to, we would talk every single day. We had, For the kids out there, we had a Snapchat streak going in, you know, for so long because we would talk about disc golf literally every single day. And then the inception of this podcast, because it was like, you know, we want to help those people who are like us, who don't know anything about disc golf, who are just getting into it, want to learn about it, want to get better, don't want to suck at disc golf. And so, yeah. and you know, one thing led to another and here we are. And, and so that's, that's just so crazy. I'm, I'm glad that I could connect with somebody else who kind of had a, oh, yeah. a, a story like that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Absolutely. Cool. You said your first disc was the Innova Valkyrie. So what about for maybe the, the newer players that just started playing and they're looking for their first disc? What about that disc when early on when, in your career would you say was the reason you loved it so much? Okay, so I probably should put a disclaimer out there that the Innova Valkyrie is not the disc you want to start with. Um, I was playing out of my brother-in-law's bag and that Valkyrie he had was a DX and it was pretty beat. So it had gotten pretty understable. And whatever arm speed I had at the time, I could throw it half decent. I mean, it wasn't great by any means, but half decent. Um, what I would tell any beginner is go for understable, slower speed stuff. Um, uh, the new putter by Innova, the Zero XERO, um, that's what I switched to wholeheartedly. Love that thing. Um, out to about 150 feet, it's nice and straight and flat and glidey. Um, and what that does, if you start throwing things like that, it will tell you where your error is. So if you're coming over the top a little bit, it's going to you know cut roll that way. Or if you hit it flat, it's going to go beautifully. Um, for a mid, something like a Mako, again, understable mid. Don't buy a rock yet. You definitely buy a rock at some point, but not yet. Um and really, I would stick with those two discs if somehow you feel the need for speed and you're thinking, okay, maybe a Speed 7, maybe something like a Leopard, um, maybe even, I'm trying to think, 
Uh, maybe even a Roadrunner in DX. That's a speed nine, but it's really, really understable. The bottom line is if you throw something understable and can get it to fly 200 to 250 feet nice and flat, you've got your swing, and now you can begin to pick that speed up. You know, don't, don't go for the high-speed stuff quick. It teaches a lot of bad habits. I'm really glad you also put a footage marker there because I feel like a lot of people have said in the past, oh, yeah, you know, you want to throw your understable stuff. I get it. But, like, I really enjoyed how you put the, hey, once if you're throwing it like this at 200 to 250, then you can do this. I think that's something that everybody can take away from right now. So if you go out there and you pick up this Roadrunner and you're hitting it 250 consistently on a flat angle, then maybe – try hyzer flipping it. Maybe you go to something with a little bit more stability. You know, maybe you, you, I think, I think something that is, has really worked for my game is throwing a disc until I'm close to mastery or nine out of 10 times, eight out of 10 times, it's going to do what I want. And if it doesn't, I know what I messed up, not what the disc is doing. Is that a good, I guess, thing to be doing, or should you just be trying out a ton of different discs and like, it kind of brings up the debate of, should you change your throw or should you change your disc to accomplish X? So for my idea, I always want to throw the same shot, no matter what. Every shot I throw is going to be flat with respect to where my chest is, okay? But what I might do is I might lean back a little bit to get more of an ante, or I'll get over to the top of the disc to get a little more hyzer. And then as far as changing the disc itself, um, like I said, I, my bag is pretty simple. I've got five or six molds in there. You know, you'll see three destroyers where one is flippy, one is straight, and one is like my wind fighter. And then it just depends on how much additional hook I need for that disc. Because I think you can get really comfortable throwing the same mold. You know, you get used to the thickness in your hand. You get used to the feel of how it flies. So I think the more things you can keep simple and consistent, the better player you can be. That was going to be my next question. So is the the benefit of throwing, having three, four, five of the same mold, is it more just the consistency of you're grabbing the same disc every time? And you just you just know if you're using the new one versus the beat up one what how it's going to fly or what the difference will be but you know the consistency is going to be the same that's the biggest takeaway from using the same uh molds yeah exactly um and part of it is just comfort you know if you if you keep switching between discs and plastics always have slight variations to them you may or may not get as comfortable especially if you're more of a weekend player and don't throw a lot but if you've got the same disc, the same plastic, it's just different levels of wear, I think you can be more consistent. When you first kind of really started taking disc golf seriously, how did you determine which molds were going to make your bag? Because there's so many different molds out there. Oh. What was your process like for going through them all and going down and choosing those five to six molds that you have now? Well, when I first got started, I threw, I mean, I, I threw everything. Um, if somebody had a disc I hadn't tried, I was like, hey, can I try it? And I listened a lot to players that had played a lot more than me, you know, and I was not bashful about, hey, would you mind, you know, I see you throwing that disc that looks great, you know, could I have five minutes of your time and, you know, talk to me? And I'd throw a shot and it would give me, it might be a form critique or it might be something like, you know, that disc is a little too stable for you right now. Go to something like this. And so I think if you if you listen to the community, um, or at least pick some people in the in the community that that have background that have thrown a ton, um, and different molds, um, and different manufacturers, I think that's a wise place to start. And then from there, you would recommend you. So say you found the Mako Three is like okay, I love this thing and I'm going to try it in two or three different plastics and then pick up a few and um, really, really hone in your skills with that disc. That would be that would be what you would recommend to any beginners out there looking for or trying to build their bag? Um, yeah, so you had to pick that disc. So the makeup... Okay, how about a... <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a Valkyrie. A little bit higher speed pl- 
disc now. Okay, so um, <laughs> so depending on the plastic, the disc is going to fly more or less stable. So the DX Valkyrie will fly less stable than the Star, which will fly less stable than the Champion Valkyrie. And what I like to do is get the same disc in the same plastic. And so like I'll have three Star Destroyers, for example, and just beat them in. Beat that first one until it comes into straight and then start working on the next one. Um, that, by the way, is hard to do. Um, what's easy to do is go online and ask people around uh, that are selling used disc um, because you can get, uh, in fact, I picked up one recently. I got a color glow Thunderbird that will flip up, turn a little right before it comes back. And the stamp is almost completely worn off of it, but it's a perfect fit for my bag. And I didn't have to take the six month beating it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The use bin is so clutch. Whatever shop you're going into, if you can find that use bin, just look through it. You might find a hidden gem or two. I can't tell. And sometimes I found discs that look pretty much like they're exactly brand new, and you're getting them for a third of the price. Oh, so yeah. yeah, it doesn't have the it doesn't have the beat inness to it, but. You're getting the same discs for a third of the price. I love used discs. I think used discs are definitely the way to go if you if you can find what you're looking for as a used disc. So I guess that kind of makes me wonder then if you are spending all this time beating in a disc, what is the best way to do that efficiently? Like especially if you're somebody like myself or Trent who we we try to play as much as we can. We probably try to go out at least two times a week if we can, three times just because of work and other things. You know, what is the best way, best allocation of our time to beat a disc in so it's not like, yeah, I've had this destroyer in my bag for five years and it's still an absolute <laughs> meat hook. Um, okay, so there's there's two there's two pieces to that one. One piece of it the PDJ will not like, but we won't tell them. And so here's the thing. Have you ever picked up a disc brand new and you reach under the bottom of it and it feels really sharp on that inside rim, really sharp? That's not part of the mold. What happens is when the disc is being extracted, that part comes up. So that's not part of the mold. That makes it more overstable. Now, Latitude 64 has started now with the Royal Line where they're, they're actually um, grinding that off and it's smooth underneath there which is pretty cool. Um, so the first thing I do is if, if I've got one and I feel that bead under there, sandpaper, get it, knock it off. That will take some of the stability off of it immediately and get it back to where the manufacturer meant for it to fly. The next thing, and believe me, I've been laughed at many times. I throw it right into the ground, right into the ground, just on edge, right into the ground. That way you don't have to walk far. You can get in 50 reps in, you know, a couple minutes. And if you're doing it like this, you're working on your forehand strength as well. Right. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first, people. That pretty brand new Sexton Firebird that you're putting in your bag, if you want it to not be as stable, just chuck it into the ground. <laughs> you won't hurt the disc. It'll probably fly better for you. Yeah, you won't hurt the disc. That's a, so, that's a great point, though. Sorry, Quentin. I was just going to no, say, the. Yeah, uh, I've noticed that before when I bought a brand new, I forehand a lot of overstable discs. I bought all kinds of different things. That little ridge on the inside, uh -huh. that is like, all. it's it's almost like cut my finger before on a new disc. So that's oh, yeah. a really good point. I know I know you're probably not supposed to sand it off. I don't know if the, is that is that legitimately a rule or? Well, what the PDGA just, says is you're not supposed to modify the disc. Um, from its original form. My argument is that's not the original form. That's not what the patent is. That's not what the PDGA approved. That's right. part of the manufacturing process. That when it gets extracted, it gives that little sharp edge. And you're right. I've actually gotten, you know, scuffed up pretty good myself on that thing. Yeah. So this is a, a weird line, I guess, kind of a gray area in the rule book then, because I can understand how the PDGA is like, yeah, don't sand your discs down, right? But how can somebody enforce that? 
I have never one time gone up to Trenton or anyone else that I've played disc golf with. I've never gone up to their disc and flipped it over and been like, yeah, uh-huh, this looks like you've sanded it. I'm calling a rules violation. Like, it, how is that enforceable? Well, so there's two things. One is um, the same – okay, so if you throw the disc enough and it keeps hitting the ground, which is going to act as an abrasive, it's going to, in effect, sand the bottom of the disc. So even if I sanded it and had it in my bag and you looked at it, you couldn't even tell. So no, it's not enforceable, in my opinion. I think I agree 100% because it just happens naturally no matter what. And then what about all the little scrapes and you exactly know, every time you hit a tree, a little get. chunk is taken out. Oh, yeah. So I think I think Trent, I think we need to do a challenge where we we get the exact same disc and one of them we sand the bottom and the other we don't sand the bottom and just literally see what is the flight difference immediately. Yeah. We do that and we got to throw it into the ground 50 times first. <laughs> yeah. The one that, the you, one that got sanded. We got to we got to do the Craig method. We got to sand it and then we got to throw it into the ground 50 yeah, times just and then bang it into the ground. <laughs> so for example, you mentioned the Leopard 3. I love that disc, love that disc, love that disc. So I got a couple of the uh, own Scoggins, you know, the Halo Leopard 3s. They come out um, much more stable. I mean, they go, like, I could hit it straight, and it's 360, 370, no problem. But that's not what I want a Leopard 3 to do. I want the Heiser flip, rod right, and then come come back kind of a thing, or flip up and go flat. So, yeah, sand and bang the crap out of it. <laughs> so while we're on the topic – are there any other rules in your mind that you think we could get away with breaking that are kind of a gray area that uh, might, you know, me, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating actively break the rules, but I mean, you know, is there um, anything else out there that you can think of? You know, things that are not enforceable. Yeah, probably. I don't think jump putts are enforceable because unless mm. you're going to roll it back yeah. on video, nobody's eyes going to see that that quick. You know, agreed. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Unless it's blatant, unless like their entire foot is in front of their lie, and then you can, yeah. But I mean, well, it's very hard to see. Right? Yeah, but it's also got to be like up, and you have to, you've got to be watching at the point the hand releases and where the foot is at the same time, and that's like okay. <laughs> you know, you, you got to have the gecko eyes for that one. On that point, do you think this is just? I'm going on a fun little tangent here. Okay. Do you think? I've heard a little bit about a um, little bit uh, about on the pro scene putting being too easy. Do you think, or I wouldn't shouldn't say it's too easy, but for that level of athlete, it's in a way too easy. Do you think step putting is ever going to move to circle two? So you can't step putt inside circle two. Um, I don't think so. Because circle two extends extends out kind of far. I mean, if it's forty feet and in, yeah, the the, the top players, uh, they're knocking most of those down. But if you're getting out to, you know, out to the edge of circle two, then I think most of them would like a little bit of step through or a little extra motion. Here's my take on it: as a step putter. Just get better. If you, if you don't want to step punt, that's your own fault. Sorry that I'm using what I can to to my advantage. So just just get a little bit better. You know, maybe you should learn to step putt. I'll teach I, you how. I've got a halfway decent step putt. Hey, Brody, um, he was the one. He put up a video a while back. He was like, this feels like cheating. And I'm looking at that, and I'm like, Man, it can't be that easy. So me and my buddy Matt that I throw with a lot, we went out and tried it. It was like – Oh my gosh! It really is that easy. Yes, and it's it's. Your, I don't think yeah. I do it right. It's your same motion. I'll, I'll show you it's your how. same everything. It's just you've got that slight bit of momentum, so the disc goes just that little bit farther. Exactly. I mean, during my last match play event, I we were playing on a course that it has it is not draining well, and we have had so much rain, and so for half the course, I probably was standing in ankles deep water, oh. and I had at least three or four step putts 
from circle two in ankles worth of water and i think i went three of four so i was feeling pretty good about that but yeah i yeah i'm glad you brought that up trent because yeah definitely a big fan of the step but i definitely think it's something that if you want more if you're listening to this right now yet you're a new listener and uh you want to hear more about that? We did an episode with Raven Newsom. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's titled Make More Putts from Circle 2. Check that out. That's a good starting point. Maybe we can come up with another episode, a little refresher on that as well. But, Craig, I want to talk more about your disc golf journey here, right? So yeah. how did you go from new person into disc golf to a pro-level disc golfer? How long did that take for you? Um, wow. That's that's a good question. I um, I'm one of those guys that when I decide to do something, I kind of go all in and, and back years and years ago, I played, uh, I played the game, you know, with the ball and the stick, the other golf. And from that, I, I learned how to break a swing down and how to practice. And I would spend as much time as I could, um, out on a soccer field, I would line up parallel to the line and I would just do standstills. I would reach back, pull through and see if I could make it go down the line. And that's, that's really where it started. And it wasn't, it didn't take too long. And I went from, let's see, I guess. So I picked up a disc in 2012. I won my first PDJ event 2013. That was a C tier. It was an M. 14, I was an AM. Uh, 16 is when I turned pro. What was the deciding factor for you to turn pro? At what, Like, how did you know your game was good enough to go pro? You know, it's not really... So for me, it wasn't so much about was my game good enough. It was that I was fortunate that in 2014, um, I was picked up by, by Innova Disc, Team Innova. And so I had all the plastic I needed. Innova is really good to their team members, providing uh, apparel, discs, hats, all that kind of good stuff. They support us very well. And so it was more like, I don't, I don't need, I don't need it anymore. And what I did is I played uh, world AMs 2016. And after I played, uh, sorry, am worlds, then I decided, okay, let's go pro. Let's, let's see what we could do. It's been a fun ride. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's awesome. So you said you bought your first disc in 2012, and you were sponsored by Team Innova in 2014. That is a quick turnaround it for was. all of us, all of us, mm-hmm. you know, ad ad or er, aspiring disc golf pros. Could you walk us through kind of how you went from this Valkyrie's kind of fun. I'm gonna buy that and go throw it, and then two years later, you're sponsored by one of the best in the business. Yeah, um, it really has to do with deciding on what you want and focusing on it. Um, that's number one. So I decided I wanted to be good at disc golf. I, you know, like I said, I'm not I'm not a halfway kind of guy. I'm either all in or all out. And I went all in. Uh, my brother in law Mike helped me a lot in terms of advice. Um, he would come up, we would play together and such. Um, and then it's finding resources that can help you. And the biggest one for me, uh, has been YouTube. And I wish there were podcasts back then, back then it was, uh, there was a few little discraft, uh, YouTube videos and that was about it. And it was going out into, like I said, soccer fields, baseball fields, wherever I could find a white line and throwing down that line and just over and over and over. And of course, you know, working on your putting. Mm-hmm. So one more time for me, could you kind of explain the, the white line drill and how do you determine a success versus a failure in that? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, what I, so what you want to do is stand parallel to the line. So let's say you're, you're out on a soccer field, you've got a white chalk line painted down it, stand parallel to that line. Uh, shoulders are parallel to the line, reach back 90 degrees where your disc is about on the line. So you're not reaching straight back or reaching out just a little bit, pull the disc into the center and then turn your body and have the disc eject again on that white line. 
which is about the 10 o'clock position. A lot of people try to throw at 12 o'clock. That's a mistake. That's you're, you're flapping your arm. You know, the disc, I mean, this, this is the entire throw right here. And you rotate your body to stay in sync with that. That's where the power comes from. And success is, you know, did it start down the line the first 50 feet? And what that allows you to do is you can throw your whole bag and throw, because like the first 50 feet of a destroyer or a rock or anything, it should be down that line. Now, what it does after that, that's just the disc. But for the first 50 feet, it needs to go straight down that line. So just to be clear, the goal of this drill is not where the disc lands. It's how the disc begins, like the beginning of the flight. That first 50 feet is the most important part of that drill. Absolutely. Now, and it depends on what you're throwing. So I love the Mako 3. That's my in-the-woods disc. I've got, you know, several of them, different wear. And so with that drill... I'll throw flat, knowing that it's going to go out straight and turn right. I'll throw hyzer, flip the flat, and let it ride, and then put it on a little more hyzer and know that it's going to hyzer out soft the other way. But the disc should maybe start on that line. Right. And maybe for some of our newer listeners, as this might be their first episode, they aren't sure what this hyzer, anhyzer, flip to flat. Could you go just a quick overview of hyzer, anhyzer, and just kind of what you're, what you're meaning by those throws? Sure. Um, hyzer means the outside edge of the disc away from your hand is lower than your hand. Anheuser is when the outside of the edge of the disc is higher than your hand. So for right hand, backhand, anheuser breaks to the right, hyzer breaks to the left, and of course flat is exactly that. Now the hyzer flip, which is my preferred shot, you throw a disc that's a little understable, you start it out on hyzer, so left edge is low. As it gains speed, it flips up and then will ride straight for the rest of the flight and then finish a little bit. Yeah, I was just going to ask really quick. So for the for the hyzer, what would you, or the anhyzer, what would you tell someone who's just starting to figure that shot out or trying to learn that shot, how their body should be should be when they're trying to release that type of throw? Should the disc just be down and their hand be down, or no. should their body be... Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, when you're learning, so let's talk about the hyzer because that's the right. most natural shot. So you you want your body to be uh, bent at the waist just slightly, so you're a little bit over the disc, and so you're taking the disc from flat and you're tipping it down this way, um, and then you would affect throw flat across your body, and the disc comes out like this because you're bent. And hyzer the same way. Now what happens with the and hyzer, you know give you this tip is most people myself included when i started want to turn the shoulder when you anheuser and what happens is you you double cross yourself so i want it to anheuser out there but when i turn i'm going to hit it too much to the inside what you have to do is learn that just like any other shot the disc comes out here well the disc has got to come out there so your shoulder has to stay in place and the tip that I would tell you is forget about where your target is out there. Pick something, you know, a mat. So Barry Schultz, he used to talk about rings and ribbons. And he would say, picture a ring in the sky and you're going to throw your disc through the sky. Or he would say, see a ribbon through the sky and put your disc flight along the ribbon. So if you're going to throw Anheuser, I pick the spot and go, okay. I see that that goes over there and I need to hit it there. That's, that's where my hit point's going to be. I feel like the Anheuser is a very difficult shot to throw just with a nose angle. I feel like you're very prone to throw nose up while throwing an Anheuser. How can you combat that mistake? Um, well, that one's, that's a great question. And, and it is, it, it's easy to do. And the first thing I would say is, um, Check your grip. Make sure that when you stick the disc out that you've done the pour in the teacup. And before you throw your Anheuser especially, make sure that that wrist angle is set before you come through. That's a great tip. And the pour your teacup, I don't know. I feel like I've talked about it before, but mm -hmm. just literally what it sounds like. You're holding the coffee cup or you're pouring yeah. a, a yeah, cup of that's a all it is or whatever. 
Yeah, that's all it is. One more thing I have to ask you on this discussion earlier, sure. you had said you wanted to throw a understable disc to hyzer flip up when you have a let's say just a little bit more overstable disc here so maybe it's that t-bird three compared to a uh, leopard or something like that so do you should you still try to hyzer flip that does that does that just take more speed or should you throw that on just a touch more anhyzer to get it to more of that s shape flight well okay so um to hyzer flip you you what you're doing is you're putting the disc on hyzer and you're hitting it with more speed than what it can handle. And that's why it flips up. So if you don't have the speed to flip up a T-Bird three, which is kind of tough to do um, because of its stability, that's not a disc to throw that on. It also depends on the shape of your hole. So let's say, you know, you've got a hole that's um, starts a little to the left, breaks right, then makes a hard back left. I'll take a destroyer, put on a big ante, push it over here, force it over, then have it come back. So it's all about the angle you need for your hole. And he, so here's a pro tip. Here's a pro tip. Um, go out into a field that's wide open. Take every disc in your bag, throw it flat, throw it hyzer, throw it anhyzer, and look at the path the disc naturally flies without any obstructions then when you're sitting in the woods and you go here's the path i need it to fly go back in the catalog and go okay which disc flies that path yeah i love that tip i've i've actually i don't do field work near enough i've talked about it a couple times on here every time i go out i mean lately when quentin and i go we always end up doing something silly so we haven't really truly done field work but every time in the past when I've gone and done that, I I go out and play the next weekend or whenever it is. The next time I play and I do the same thing and it's I learn something every time. So yeah. I've said this 40 times on this show. Do your field work, people. Pay yeah. attention to what, how your discs fly and you will thank yourself time and time again out there on the course. It's, it's amazing I mean how much it helps. Remember the challenge. Remember when we challenged right. all y'all one field work session a month? It's not that hard. You can do it. One <laughs> field work session a month. Uh, and you'll see in Wednesday's video, so last week's video, uh, Trent and I, we were doing some field work, but instead decided to play another sport with discs. Uh. And let me tell you what, if you, if you haven't seen that video yet, you guys got to go check that out. The ending to that is absolutely priceless. I'm not going to give it away. It's absolutely priceless. <laughs> it drops tomorrow. Oh, okay. wait, no, that's last week. You're right. <laughs> yep, yep, we're in the future. We're so in the future. so something that was really interesting in our little kind of discussion before we got going was you said the first, I believe, pro tournament you won, you were also a TD in. Could you maybe go into a little <laughs> bit of detail about that? Yes, I can. Um, so I had moved from Minneapolis down to Atlanta, and I was new to the Atlanta scene. I want to get plugged in, into the disc golf area. And on the Atlanta, you know, everybody's got a Facebook page, Atlanta Disc Golf Facebook page. This guy, Wes Campbell, said, hey, Hotlanta, the TD was not able to do what he needed to do. And I reached out to Wes and said, I've not done it before. What's involved? I'll be glad to help. He told me. So I took my, uh, my uh, officials exam, got that, you know, um, registered for the event, all the stuff. And so it went from no TD to being a TD in like two weeks. And so Wes, um, very experienced with it. He was um, a local vendor down in Atlanta area, you know, with discs. And so, um, and so because he was a TD and I was a TD and at the time with seniors, you didn't have to have a TD back at the booth. You, you do now. So I was able to play. So here it is. It's Saturday morning. Get out there way early, setting up the tent, getting scorecards, doing all the TD stuff, and he's teaching me all this stuff. I do not even get to throw not one practice putt, not one practice shot before round one. Shot, what did I shoot? 970, 965, something like that. It, you wow. you can actually look it up. It's like just really there. Um, 
So now it's the halfway time and now, you know, adding scorecards, getting people back on cars and rushing around. I'm trying to get food in me. And again, second round, I get no practice putts, no practice shots, and ended up in a three-way tie for first place. So now nice. it's uh, – I can't remember the other two guys' names. Anyway, so hole one, here we go. Uh, me and the one guy uh, both put our drives in pretty good spots. The, the third guy was kind of off to the side. He didn't make it around the corner, so he was out. I'm putting for um, – I'm putting for three. Completely nervous. I clock cage. My playing competitor, who's closer, clonks the cage, putting for three. So now we both have tap-in fours, and he says to me, and I'll never forget it, he said, that was a gift for being the TD. That just <laughs> got me angry. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. So we walk over to hole two. It's on now. Yeah, so we walk over to hole two. Um, I threw a good shot, about a 20-foot putt he was just slightly outside of me he missed i made there you go and and by the way go and warm up and throw practice shots and practice putts just was, because it I was gonna ask mean that <laughs> <laughs> what's your just uh just real quick what's your normal like prep for a turn up or for a round um what do you normally do before you start playing i want to get to the course wherever i am about an hour ahead i want to just kind of for the first probably 10 or 15 minutes, you know, I, I always know a lot of people there. So I just sit and talk and chit chat and just kind of, just kind of get the vibe, just kind of get, get the element. And then I want to go and I want to throw short shots, you know, 150 feet, maybe throw some putter, throw some mids, just giving the body a chance to get loose, not rushing anything. Uh, from there, I'll throw a little bit longer shots, but I'm not throwing hard yet. Um, then I want to go putt. I'll spend more of my time putting. Then I'll go back. I'll go ahead and open the arm up, throw some long shots, um, just to kind of see where it's going. Because it's the shorter shots that are more important, really, and especially the putting. And then right before you know they call us to the tee, I'll spend the last few minutes short, close to the basket, say 20 feet, because I want – in my brain, I want the confidence that the last putt you practiced went in. So 20 mm -hmm. feet, just knock them in. I know a lot of guys go from 25 or 30. 20 feet is fine by me. I just want, again, I want that confidence. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. I mean, honestly, sometimes what I'll do, if I miss three putts in a row, I'm, I'll walk away. I'll go play else. a hole yep. or two and then I'll putt again. I'm not going to, I don't want to get that, that negative feeling in my head because something I did notice and it really ended up being, it was the worst rated round I've ever had. And thankfully it got dropped. So that was pretty clutch for my yeah. rating. We'll, we'll talk about ratings here in yeah. a sec. We're going to talk about them. The hot takes about to be spicy, yeah. but I, what I did was I went up to the hole and my first like 20 putts, just absolute money. No problem. Wasn't even thinking about it. And then I probably went 5 of 10, and then probably about another 6 of 10, and then probably about another 6 of 10. And I was like, ooh, you know, this this isn't really feeling too hot. And I kind of got in my head, and what I should have done is the first time I went 5 of 10, I should have moved on, played a hole or two, and then went back to practice putting because then in the second round I maybe did 10 practice putts and they were all from 10 feet, maybe 12, 15 feet. Like it was literally, I just, I literally just wanted to see the disc go in the basket and consistently remind myself that I can do this. And it was a completely different round for me. So I really love that tip. And that is something, again, you don't have to be at, you know, and, I don't take this in any offense, Craig, but you don't have to be at your level. You don't have to be as good a disc golfer that you are to be able to go out and make 10 foot putts and feel good before your tournament rounds. That is something that everybody listening to this podcast can take away right now. And I would hope that you would go do, even if you're going to go play with your friend, throw five bucks on it and get there 10 minutes early and just putt from 10 feet and in and just get that confidence built up. And I, I promise you, you're going to feel better about your round moving forward because of it. Yeah. So I want to tag onto that. Um, 
if you are, so whatever distance you're comfortable at, the point is make your last putts before you go tee off, make it at that distance and make sure you nail them. And when you're, when you're having a practice session, do not practice missing. That's right. the worst thing you can do. Go to 10 feet. So this is, this is a drill I do to myself all the time. I'll be maybe 12, 15 feet. I make one putt. Then I take two steps back, which backs me up about five feet, say. Then I make the next putt. I'll have, say, four or five putters in my hands. And I'll keep doing that until I miss. And then if I miss, I have to make the next one. If I don't make the mess, next one, I have to move closer. So I'm always practicing making, not missing. Again, part of that's mental, but part of it's physical. You know, if you keep practicing like missing, you're, pra- you're teaching yourself where the wrong line is. Yeah, and I would say I've even noticed sometimes when I'm warming up, when I'm uh, just to add a little bit, I'll I'll practice putting and I'll be like, eh, that doesn't feel too great. But then I don't really do anything about it and I go play the round and then I wonder why I wasn't good at putting. I really like the uh, the tip, Quentin, to <laughs> throw a few putts and if it's not feeling good, go, I don't know, go, go throw 150 foot putter shots just to warm up your arm a little bit more and come back to putting. And then also, Craig, to touch on your point, practice making putts don't practice if it if it doesn't feel good you're, you're doing something wrong you know just don't keep doing the same thing go try something else for a minute or work on something else and then get back to putting and and uh you, it'll pay dividends i'm sure yeah absolutely yeah i mean one last point on that it's one of those things where i'll go out and i'll start practice putting when i take my dogs out if within my first 20 putts if i'm at 14 or less makes I just go back inside I or I'll just watch them like I'm not going to continue to because I almost feel as though it's then a dead a degradation of my skills and my confidence and, and mental game and all those stuff because you just keep seeing either air balls chain outs whatever all those stuff so I just I don't want to put those bad vibes into my head but yeah I think so many people have probably learned a ton from this if you're one of those people hit the like button right now comment down below what has been your favorite part of this episode do you walk away when you're practice putting and you've missed a couple or do you just continue to try to grind through it I'd love to hear from you guys but like I said when I was talking about ratings a little bit we had something a little hot and spicy for you guys today we have we've talked a little bit about this in the past but I'm excited to hear what your point of view here is, Craig. What is your hot take for us tonight? Uh, my hot take is the PDGA rating system is flawed. It doesn't really work and never really worked. Why? Why? Here we go. Um, the PDJ rating system... Okay, so let's talk about how, how ratings are, are gathered up. What happens is you go play a tournament and there, have to be, there has to be at least eight propagators in the field and a propagator is a person that's played i forget how many rounds in the last 12 months whatever it is anyway they played regularly enough so that their average is relatively it's averaged out it it can't say stable but it's at least averaged out and that that's going to be my point so here's what happens you get somebody that's rated rated 900 and they've been working on their game for two months. They haven't played in two months, a tournament, but all of a sudden they shoot a thousand rated round. They've been working their butt off the last two months, but what happens to the ratings is the ratings calculator decides that the course is playing soft. So everybody's ratings Mm. are lowered because that person shot hot. The way the ratings should be done, um, so the PGA and the uh, USGA, and that's the regular ball golf guys, have it figured out. And what you have is you've got a slope and a rating, which is sets the difficulty of the course, not how the players played the course that day. Now, of course, what the ratings also do is it takes into account wind, uh, because at the bottom of the TD report, there's always weather, and you tell them all the stuff, and they make their calculations on that. But the biggest thing that, that troubles me about ratings is the PBGA has the SSA 
numbers for all the courses. So they could, in fact, they used to publish it. They don't anymore. I don't know why. Um, they used to publish the difficulty of the course. So you could go, okay, I'm 900 rated. If I play this course, I should shoot around this number. And that was available. And I don't know what happened to it, but it's not there. And that's why I think the rating system, more, more in the amateur levels um, or lower pro levels, is really flawed. When you get up to guys where you're talking about, you know, Double G and Paul and all those guys, you're not going to influence that level because they're up at an, at an elite level and they've been playing that rating for so long. Plus, they're probably not going to be playing in the events that you're playing. <laughs> That's such a good take. And I'm going to be potentially, if I shoot well in the first tournament playing, a prime example of your, your initial setup because I am currently rated 880. I haven't played in two months. Quentin and I, he's been whooping me in these YouTube channels, but when we actually play, <laughs> we're relatively close to each other. Okay. Um, but besides, besides the point, the, uh, I have, Quentin, me and you have talked about it before. Why, why do they, it's interesting to know that they used to have course ratings, but I have wondered the same thing. Why not, why not just, um, rate the course, give the course, like have a broad, I mean, it can't be that broad, but have like an overall rating system for the courses that is strenuous and there's maybe not strenuous, but there's certified people who go and give these courses legitimate ratings rather than de be dependent on, you know, having eight players show up to the event that have played more than, I don't know what the number is, 15 rounds in the last 12 months. I have wondered that since I started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. And I think this is one of the better takes that I've heard on the rating system. And being a pandemic disc golfer, I think you and I have definitely learned a thing or two because I did not know mm -hmm. that that used to be public information, mm -hmm. that you could see, search a course and you'd know what the score was there. And I think that's something I can understand a little bit, the logistics behind why right. that might be a little difficult. How are you going to get somebody out to every single course? I think you can, I mean... If they do some sort of a partnership with you, Disc, or the person who takes care of the course, or some, I feel as though there's avenues to where they don't have to send an official PVGA employee or volunteer yeah. to go play the course in order to get a score for the uh, for the course. And I, and I think that you can even keep the weather. So let's say if you are a 900 rated disc golfer and you're shooting an even par. Let's say that's what the course is. And now let's say the wind is zero to 10 miles per hour, okay? That is no change, okay? Now it's 11 to 20 miles per hour. That is a plus two stroke difference. So now if you are a 900 rated disc golfer, you would be shooting a plus two, okay? Now it is 21 to 30 miles per hour throw another two strokes on there or, or whatever you want the increment to be, that's fine. I think you can do that relatively well and it makes it so that ratings are more legitimate to the course because if you play a A tier and shoot the exact same that you do in a C tier, your rating's gonna be better in the A tier. Absolutely. Because there should, in theory, be better competition there. Mm -hmm. So if you see your pro field has higher rated players in it, you want to play in that event because your rating will get inflated with them. But if those folk aren't there, and let's say the highest rated person is a 940, it's not going to rate well. You can shoot, like you were saying, a thousand rated, but because the highest rated person's 940, 950, it, your rating's not going to be good. Yeah. Where that's not the truth. Right. You killed that course. It, it should be, it should reflect how you did on that course. Right. I couldn't agree yeah. more. Yeah. And again, the one that always bugged me, and I've played in enough events to, to, to see it, is you have somebody who has a lower rating and comes out and shoots hot, just has a great round, shoots out of their mind, whatever it is. But instead of going, hey, he shot a great round and, or she, and here's that number, the rating system goes, the course is playing soft that day, so everybody's numbers are lower, which isn't the case. So that, So again, it's the whole thing like rate the course. Right. And it negates, like you said at the beginning, 
that player go, putting in two months worth of steady work to, to be better, it just negates all that because their, their rating is not going to show it. So that's, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I would love to see it. Well, that was a fantastic discussion. I am super excited to get into the ace round now. These are the same five questions we ask all of our guests. See how their answers differ. Here are a couple of tips, some fun stories. Triton, get us started on the T of number one. What do we got? All right. So you you did answer this one a little bit earlier, but we're going to go ahead and re rehash it out a little bit. So you're taking a beginner to get their first three discs. Um, for the sake of the question, what bear or er, what driver, mid, and putter would you recommend the beginner picks up? Putter, anything that's going to be neutral. I like the Innova Zero. That's X-E-R-O. Uh, for a mid, the Mako. Um, probably not the Mako 3. It's a little bit uh, faster. Um, and for a driver, I would go with a Leopard. If, if, you, if you absolutely said, hey, twist my arm, I'm getting a driver. Second question we got for you. What is the favorite course you have played and one course you have yet to play that you want to cross off your bucket list? Maple Hill is the bucket list uh, course for sure. Um, one of my favorite courses that I've played uh, here locally, Bethel University is a gym um, and it's tough. So if you ever make it over, over to the Twin Cities, Bethel University, you got to play it. So if you could go back, knowing what you know now, to 2012 when you first started playing, what would you tell yourself? I would tell myself to start with different discs. I would say pick up, you know, understable mids and learn to throw those first because, you know, like everybody else, I was just trying to huck it hard. And mm -hmm. if you can figure out how an understable disc flies and can – spin it up to about say 250 and keep it flat you you've learned your your angle control and getting the disc to spin yeah that's a really good one fourth question we got for you what is your favorite memory playing disc golf you know i i've, I've heard you ask this to people and I, I have such i have a laundry list of favorite memories um what one of the most recent ones and actually it's going back a few years now um so myself and Andrew Zimmern, uh, do you guys know Andrew Zimmern, the Bizarre Foods guy? The chef? Yep. 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 So anyway, he lives here. He and I got together and put put together a huge event um, out at Blue Ribbon Pines. Uh, the Big Woo played. We had um, – the, the coolest thing about it is it was a benefit to benefit Second Harvest uh, Homeland, and that's a food shelf. And – we introduced, I don't know, well over 500 people to the game of disc golf by having uh, just, uh, it would come up for five bucks. Here's a DX mid. Here's a mini, a little nine hole course, um, just set up on the driver ranch hole and have people there to kind of tutor them all the way through or walk them the whole way around. Um, and then, of course, we had, you know, a regular event on the other 26 holes of Blue Ribbon Pines. And we raised just a ton of money for Second Harvest. And it's it was such a great day. If I had something like that when I was first starting a few couple of few years ago, that would have been incredible. I mean, YouTube, like you said, YouTube and like you said earlier, YouTube and podcasts and all that have definitely helped me a ton. Mm -hmm. But that would be good for you for doing that. That's awesome. Yeah. And if, do you do events like that often? I mean, yeah. do you, you and Andrew Zimmern run events every year? Cause that would be cool. Yeah. So, so <laughs> AZ and I don't run events every year. AZ and I always get a few rounds in every year, but what I do person. So I used to TD events, um, like hot Lana and it was normal events, you know, payouts, all this stuff. I don't really do that anymore. What I do is I do events for charitable causes. Um, twice a year I do a toys for tots event. Um, one here, one in Atlanta uh, that my brother-in-law now has taken over. Um, and then um, in Baltimore, we do one for uh, Johns Hopkins. Awesome. And giving back, it's the best feeling in the world. All right, here we go. Final question for you. Okay. What is the biggest mistake you see new players make? Um, I would say two. One is the, the age-old buying the disc that's too fast for their arm. They hear somebody throws it really far, so they go buy that one. Teaches a lot about habits. 
The second one is they tend to, they hear the word run up and literally try to run up. It's not a run up. It's a walk up. I mean, watch Simon throw it 500 feet and just watch how slow his feet are or Drew or any of these guys that really bomb it. The purpose of the walk up and the X step is to get your hip turned so you can use your hip to power the throw. It's not the run up. When you, if you try to run too quick, then things get out of sync, just goes funny places, all kinds of bad stuff could happen. But, but Craig, uh-huh. what about what about disc golf Jesus? What about the world <laughs> champion? What about James Conrad yeah. in the three mile run up? Yeah, there are exceptions. And James practices really hard every day. And he is absolutely an exception. And if you look at, um, you know, or, okay, so I'll take it, I'll take it a different direction. Look at the 360 throws. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. They're not running fast into the 360. The reason they're doing the 360 is so they can get more turning power out of the hips. The hips power the throw. It's mm-hmm. not the run up. So get get yeah, your yeah. feet right. But yeah, you're right. And James yeah, Conrad right. is a bomber. Throws his entire yeah. body into the shot. Um, but he does it he's all day, well. every day, and so he's practiced it, and he's fantastic at it. And for as many James Conrads as there are, there's probably a hundred Quintins that try to do something similar <laughs> to that and are rated like 900 and are not very good at disc golf. So, so there's that. I just I, I knew somebody was going to oh, yeah. was thinking that, so I had to be yeah. the one who who said that. But no, hey, you're right. Craig, this was so much fun, man. Totally learned a lot from you. I really enjoyed our conversation. Where can people continue to follow and connect with your disc golf journey? Um, my big connection point is Instagram, uh, around eleven thousand followers or so there, and that is at Craig N Five C R A I G, the letter N and the number five. Awesome, Craig. It was an absolute pleasure having you on. If you guys enjoyed this episode with Craig, make sure you leave a like rating on YouTube. Comment down below. Are you a walk-up kind of guy or gal, or are you a run-up kind of guy or gal? We would love to hear from you guys. And thank you to all of those Patreon supporters. We definitely appreciate everything you're doing. Be on the lookout. We've got a special podcast with those supporters coming up here pretty quick super excited about that that's going to wrap us up for this week's episode we will see you guys next week